the Steam Deck. It only does everything. Do you guys remember that PS3 marketing campaign? That's how this week's gaming news makes me feel about the Steam Deck. A new big game became compatible, and we have details for Spider-Man Remastered and more. So let's get into it. But instead of my normal musical intro, as we get started folks, I'm gonna ask you to hit that like button if you like my videos. It really helps this spread to more people. And if you're new to this channel, don't forget to subscribe. As I was telling my daughter that I was going downstairs to work on my video, here's what she said. Lots of subscribers. She told me to promise her, so yeah, that's exactly what I did. So if you want to help me keep that promise, then go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Alright, what's good Deck Gang? Did you all see the Sony anti-compete lawsuit? That case recently got dismissed, but I was watching it closely because I think the details serve as a good contrast to how Valve treats their own digital store. You see, the suit alleged that Sony is encouraging anti-compete behavior by exclusively selling digital games on the PlayStation Store. According to CourtHouseNews.com, quote, until April 2019, gamers could buy download codes for digital PlayStation games from a number of places including Best Buy, Walmart, and Amazon. Then Sony decided to cut out the middleman and establish itself as the only marketplace where video game publishers could sell digital copies of PlayStation games." End quote. Again, this sort of stands in contrast to Steam, where you can buy Steam games on other marketplaces like Green Man Gaming, Humble, Fanatical, Games Planet, etc. Sometimes for cheaper than Steam, though not exactly, I'll come back to that. And that's all before you get into the murky subject of key shops. In any event, the case was dismissed earlier this week. According to the ruling, the plaintiffs had to prove that Sony's decision led to reduced output, increased prices, or decreased quality. And while the plaintiffs did claim that it led to increased prices, the judge was not satisfied that it was a result of Sony removing the option to buy from physical locations and thus ruled to dismiss the suit. Pivoting back to Valve and Steam, this reminds me of an active lawsuit of which Valve is the defendant. The plaintiffs allege, among other things, that Valve has actually had an unwritten policy in place where they would quote delist any games available for sale at a lower price elsewhere whether or not using Steam keys, end quote. Effectively, this would ensure that games on Steam, which means virtually all PC games, could not be sold for cheaper elsewhere. Valve tried to have this case dismissed but failed back in May, and while the case against Sony is dismissed, the plaintiffs have 30 days to amend their claim with additional evidence. I'll be keeping an eye on these suits as the story develops. In other news, Ubisoft seems to be readjusting their strategy for the foreseeable future. I wasn't looking forward to any of the games that were cancelled or delayed, but it does sound like Ubisoft is going to be cutting costs, and so I feel for any of the developers that are affected. In particular, four games were cancelled, including Ghost Recon Frontline, Splinter Cell VR, and two unannounced titles. Ghost Recon Frontline received a lot of pushback for shedding the distinctive Ghost Recon personality and instead looking to be similar to games that are already on the market like Call of Duty Warzone. The Splinter Cell VR title was an exclusive for Oculus Quest 2 and it seemed to be facing troubled development. In addition to the four cancellations, Avatar Frontiers of Pandora has been delayed to 2023 or 2024 and this all comes on the heels of news that their pirate game Skull and Bones is also facing a difficult development period. Ubisoft does still have a number of Assassin's Creed projects as well as the sequel to Mario and Rabbids which I personally am looking forward to but this gutting of projects cannot spell good things for the studio as a whole. And look, I don't know a whole lot about the business of games, but I do think there's still a huge market for the experiences that have made Ubisoft the giant that they are, and I'm hoping they can pull it together. Finally, for this segment, I don't understand how or why Tim Sweeney continues to bring bad press to the Epic Games Store, but yeah, he's done it again. Earlier this week, Mojang took a stand and published a post saying that, quote, blockchain technologies are not permitted to be integrated inside our Minecraft client and server applications, nor may they be utilized to create NFTs associated with any in-game content, including worlds, skins, persona items, or other mods, end quote. Their post was well thought out, and honestly, I thought they backed up their decision with really solid reasoning. They pointed out that the scarcity of NFTs don't align with their desire to be inclusive of the whole community. They also pointed out that the speculative pricing takes focus from gameplay and instead moves it onto profit engineering. Also, being third-party NFTs, they would require an asset manager who just might disappear without notice. Following that well-reasoned post, Tim Sweeney said the following, quote, 
Developers should be free to decide how to build their games, and you are free to decide whether to play them. I believe stores and operating system makers shouldn't interfere by forcing their views onto others. We definitely won't." End quote. So I have an admittedly dumb question. Other than maybe Ubisoft Court, are there any NFT or blockchain games on EGS? Or is this just a hypothetical that Tim Sweeney is putting forth? Let me know in the comments, but I'll be curious to see where this goes. All right, we got a juicy info drop for the PC release of Spider-Man Remastered, including a features trailer. First of all, it's now available for pre-order on the Steam Store page. It was available to buy starting on Wednesday of last week, meaning it was only available for pre-order for like half of last week. And yet it was still number three for Steam's top sellers of that week, only trailing behind the Steam Deck and Stray. That's a big deal, especially considering the game isn't out for another couple of weeks. This game is obviously going to do great on Steam, and you know what that means? More Sony games to PC. By the way, just so you know, you might be able to pick this up for almost 20% off. It's part of the July XP bonus pack over at GreenManGaming.com. If you've done any shopping on Green Man Gaming, go ahead and log on and see if you have an 18% coupon for Spider-Man Remastered since that brings the price down to under 50 bucks. I picked mine up so I'm ready to play it on the Steam Deck. So how will it play on the Steam Deck? Funny you ask because we got PC specs for this web slinger. Here are the details. There's no direct analog to the Steam Deck here but the recommended column is the closest. Based on this, I think we're going to see an easy 40 FPS on a medium preset. We might even be able to improve some of the individual settings to high and still maintain that 40 FPS. As for features, this PC port comes with a wide range of resolutions and aspect ratios, unlock frame rate, ray trace reflections, improved shadows, as well as NVIDIA DLSS and DLAA. There's also dual sense support, including haptic feedback and dynamic trigger effects. Of course, that's awesome, but unfortunately, it only works with a wired USB C connection to the dual sense, so that's pretty annoying. Nonetheless, this finally launches on August 12th, and I'll be there on day one. We still don't have a release date for The Last of Us to PC, but the latest trailer is looking solid. In addition to greatly improved graphics, models, and animations, there's also upgraded physics and AI. There's also new modes like permadeath and speedrun, and those are welcome additions. The unlockables and model viewer are cool, and perhaps the most important additions are the accessibility features. There are over 40 of them. Many of these were previously implemented in The Last of Us 2, and they include a screen reader, audio and vibration cues, motion sickness sliders, and more. They even noted that this is probably the first PlayStation game with audio description of cinematic scenes built into the game. And honestly, that is amazing. I'm really coming around to this remake. I gave it crap, and even though I do still have sticker shock at the price, I was wrong. This is a thoughtful upgrade to say the least. Also, I'd like to borrow this tweet from Steve Saylor. He says, quote, I don't care what you think. To me, if The Last of Us Remake makes a barely playable game for disabled players to an almost fully accessible game for disabled players, that is 100% worth $70. Period. Alright, with some of the broader news out of the way, let's move into Steam Deck news. So here's a big one. Halo Infinite is now playable on SteamOS. This works for both single player and multiplayer, but with a few caveats. Let's start with the steps to get this working. These steps were shared on the Steam Deck subreddit by Dan the Bloke, and as always, the link will be in the description. First, change your system update channel to preview. If you're on stable, you're actually going to have to switch to beta before you can switch to preview. Then switch to the desktop and fire up Proton Up QT. If you don't have Proton Up QT, just get it from the Discover Store. It's basically the first app you should download from the Discover Store since it helps make some games playable. Once you have Proton Up running, install GE-Proton7-26. While still on the desktop, open Steam and go to Halo Infinite. If you haven't already installed Halo, go ahead and do so now. Once installed, right click it, go to Settings, Properties, Compatibility, and set this to use GE-Proton7-26. Finally, right click the game and browse local files. Some of the video playback still doesn't work, so you're going to have to rename the videos folder. And now this should be ready to play. Now this playback isn't perfect. Like I said, videos don't work. So once you rename that folder, it's just going to skip over playing those videos during single player progression. Not ideal to say the least. 
Also, Dan Bloke noted that the audio does clip at times, and generally speaking, the process was a tad cumbersome. I don't mean installing Proton GE, that stuff is fine, but I was on the stable channel, so I did have to choose beta, wait for the install, then choose preview, wait for the install again, then Halo wanted to download the updated shader caches, and then the Microsoft login was giving me trouble because I couldn't see the numbers at the authenticator prompt. Also, the game crashed like the first one or two times. Anyway, this should all improve in the future since Pierre Luc from Valve has alluded to official Halo compatibility improvements coming in the future. That said, getting it up and running was still worth it to me since I do love this game. It's really fun to play and I think the single player is well made though I do understand people's frustrations with the multiplayer. What do you think? Will you be running Halo on SteamOS? I also played Stray on deck this week. This game runs well enough, maybe just at the cusp of Verified. There are parts in Stray with severe drops, as low as the teens in some places, but usually these are short and I think it's related to loading in new content. Outside of that, I can maintain a cool 40 FPS most of the time by lowering the resolution scaling to 70%. I even played this docked for an hour or two, I raised the resolution up to 1080p and moved to a 30 FPS cap instead of 40. The 70% scaling is very noticeable on a bigger screen, but I got used to it pretty quickly. Overall, this game has lived up to the hype for me. Yes, it's a short game, but yeah, I love short, relaxing games, so that's not a problem for me. I love the world building and the storytelling, and I was invested in this little cat's adventures. And look at this! Modders are taking to making the cat look like their own cat, and that's gotta be the most adorable news of the week. Thankfully, this title has sold very well, this week it was number 2 on Steam's top sellers list, hopefully that means we will be seeing more from this developer in the future. One more big compatibility update for this week is Multiverses. Gaming on Linux showed off that this is compatible with Steam Deck using the Proton Easy Anti-Cheat Runtime. That's pretty awesome because I'm looking forward to trying this game out. I haven't scored a key yet and I'm not ready to put down $40 to get early access to the open beta, but I am looking forward to trying this out when it officially launches tomorrow. Of course, this is another top seller for this week. Despite being free to play, the Founders Package, which as mentioned is $40 and gives early access to the open beta, debuted on the Steam charts at number 9. With all this talk about top sellers, I may as well give you the rest of the list. Credit to Morwell for the image and summary. I already mentioned that Steam Deck, Stray, and Spider-Man are forming the top three, and Multiverses comes in at number nine. Raft went from number two to number four in its second week out of early access. Dinkum debuts at number five in its first full week of early access. If you don't know, Dinkum is a Stardew Valley meets Animal Crossing title and it gets incredible reviews on Steam. No Man's Sky is back again at number six. It's really impressive how often this game is in the top ten. The VR Index Kit remains in the 7th spot with Elden Ring dropping from 4th to 8th. Finally, Ready or Not is now in the 10th spot after being number 5 last week. I haven't played Ready or Not yet, but I understand it's a spiritual successor to the SWAT series, so I am incredibly interested. And guess what? Each of the games on this list are at least playable on the deck. Amazing! By the way, there was a Steam Deck software update that apparently does nothing. <laughs> Here's what the update said, quote, The stable update channel for the Steam Deck OS has just been updated with a hotfix to enable compatibility with future system and input firmware. It will download an update, but there are no user visible changes included at this time." End quote. Enable compatibility with future system and input firmware. I'm very curious to know what that means, so post your tinfoil hack conspiracy theories in the comments. Heroic Games Launcher received a big update. It now has support for GOG cloud saves, the Epic Overlay, and the Proton Anti-Cheat Runtimes for EAC and BattleEye. There's also integration with RBAntiCheat.com, which is pretty cool. This is a really solid update, so check it out if you get a chance. I also want to touch on a couple awesome Steam Deck videos. Gardner Bryant recently compared a launch Steam Deck against the Q3 Steam Deck and pointed out some surprising differences, including a difference in weight as well as improve Steam and quick access buttons. That is awesome. I don't know if it's just me, but I think the D-pad is improved too. What do you think, Gardner? LTT published an awesome short where everything about the Steam Deck was upgraded, including three terabytes of storage, Hall effect sticks, the Frankenstein cooling system that he's shown off before, a magnetic battery pack, joystick condoms, and of course, 
Linus touchpad covers. How cool. Finally, ETA Prime has been doing a bunch of Steam Machine videos where he takes mini PCs or gaming home theater PCs and kits them out with Steam OS. I'm bringing this up because I've been playing a lot of dock gaming recently, and yeah, I think I'm ready for a setup like this. I really want to build a small but decent 1440p rig, install Steam OS, and hook it up to the TV permanently. What do you think? Should I do this? Let me know in the comments. All right, and before we move on to the community spotlight, let's talk about a few games. Hey, you wanna see a squirrel with a gun? I mean, did you see that? It was a squirrel with a gun. Like he shoots an Uzi downwards to hover in midair. I want it. In all seriousness, I've been following the development of this for a little bit and it looks like good fun. It now has a Steam wishlist page, so go ahead and wishlist it. Also, the upcoming new Star Wars game from Respawn, Jedi Survivor, now has a Steam Store page as well. And here's another one. Ember Bane was recently announced and it's coming in May, but this has a dope trailer and a store page as well, so check it out. Oh, and did you see Winter's expansion for Resident Evil Village? There's a third person mode, you can play as Lady D in Merc's mode, plus a new scenario where you play as Ethan's daughter. Sounds like a pretty chunky DLC for $20 coming just in time for Halloween on October 27th. By the way, in addition to Stray, there were two other releases last week that caught my eye, Hell Pie and X Zodiac. Hell Pie ran decently on Steam Deck, 40 FPS most of the time. It also seemed like a well-made game, but the platforming wasn't clicking for me, so honestly, I didn't play very much. But X Zodiac, on the other hand, was wonderful. It's clearly inspired by Star Fox, but I think it surpasses the inspiration so far. It's so damn good and has some neat secrets like bonus levels inspired by Space Harrier. This is an early access with half of the 12 levels currently available. At 10 bucks, it's a bargain. This week we're going to see a couple more cool games coming including Sims 4 DLC and Digimon Survive on Thursday. Also out on Thursday is Bear and Breakfast, an adorable looking life sim management game. You run a bed and breakfast but you're a bear. I dig it. As I mentioned before, Multiverses is out tomorrow and I'm really looking forward to trying this one out. And my most likely pickup for this week is Tarnishing of Juxtia. This looks reminiscent of Death's Gambit and Blasphemous and it's from a studio called Actual Nerds. This game is out tomorrow. Be sure to follow me on Twitter or join me in the fan the deck discord if you want to hear my thoughts on this one and finally for today i have two community spotlights the first is a mock-up of the steam deck with the umd drive by maxe corteriso as someone who's constantly calling the steam deck a vita 2 aka a psv3 i am in love with this mock-up also from the steam deck subreddit is this post by doro penguin where they go over why some games see major frame pacing issues in gaming mode as they say in this post some games like warriors orochi 3 has forced v-sync and this is interfering with the steam deck's own forced v-sync by way of the wayland compositor they note that a proper fix would take some time because it would require Wayland to implement optional vSync, then Gamescope would need to use the optional vSync, then Valve would need to upgrade the Steam Deck to use the updated Gamescope, then Valve would need to expose the toggle. So in the meantime, if you want to play those games with proper frame pacing, you'd have to do so in desktop mode. That's really disappointing, but I really appreciate Doro Penguin's efforts in putting that information together in one place. Steam Deck subreddit for the win once again. And that's going to do it for today's news roundup. As always, if you've enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the like and subscribe. And if you feel like helping me out a little more, consider joining awesome folks like Marcel and Survive Combatants on my Patreon. What an awesome name, by the way. Deck Gang out. Goodbye. Yeah.